A six-hour manhunt for a killer on the run comes to a dramatic end at the Montana-Idaho border. It's the morning of June 14, 2003. Earlier, over the radio, Deputy Sheriff David Conway gets word that an officer has been shot. Affirmative. Ravalli County officer is down. Conway races toward the scene when suddenly a gold Ford Taurus crosses three lanes of traffic, nearly running him off the road. He tried to ram me. If somebody gets a chance, take him out. Inside the Ford Taurus is George Davis. He's not only shot an officer, he's killed a man and left six others wounded the night before near a bar in Ennis, Montana. Michael Carroll was there. He had ran up a tab of 12 or 14 drinks and didn't have the funds to pay for it. It seemed like he was getting very, not just upset, but just uh, like distraught about the whole issue of it. Carroll says he paid Davis bar tab, hoping he would leave. Davis does leave the bar, but he shows up outside moments later and suddenly opens fire. One of Carol's friends is shot and killed crossing the street. George Davis then turns his gun on Michael Carroll. George Davis was in front of me. He raised the gun up and looked at me and kind of with almost like black piercing eyes seemed to like look right through me. I started to turn around and I was kind of squatched over and uh, he shot me and the bullet had gone into right above my belly button. Luckily, someone pulls Carol back inside the bar before Davis can shoot him again. But Carol's girlfriend at the time is still outside and Davis shoots her in the hip. Soon after, he goes back to his car and drives off. Davis drives through the Montana night. The next morning, Ravalli County Deputy Bernie Allstad pulls him over for speeding. But before the deputy can get out of the car, Davis attacks, shooting up his vehicle. Allstad is wounded and Davis is also hit, but he gets away. That's when Deputy Conway gets the call that an officer is down and he's nearly run off the road. Montana trooper Jason Hildenstab joins Conway in the chase. He's working an extra shift and just clocked in, so he's low on gas. That was going to be my first order of business to go get my car filled up. And knowing that I was going to be in a, a long high-speed pursuit in a matter of minutes. But there's no time to lose, and before he knows it, Hildenstab is chasing George Davis at speeds reaching 120 miles per hour. Hildenstab is running on empty, and Conway can't keep up with Davis. Hildenstab takes the lead in the pursuit and edges closer to Davis, getting a better look at the suspect. He was looking up in his rearview mirror at me. I could see him doing that. He was kind of giving me the eyeball, and at one point he was combing his hair. During the pursuit, I was pretty stunned that he was that focused and not that relaxed. He had just been in a gunfight. Suddenly, driving more than 100 miles an hour, Davis slams on his brakes, then maneuvers to face Officer Hildenstab. Davis takes cover and then steadily aims his 45 automatic at Hildenstab. When someone's shooting at you at that close, the muzzle looks like it's pointed right at your head. And it was surprising the when after each round he fired, I, I felt I'd be hit. Hildenstab takes cover behind his vehicle and he avoids Davis's fire. Deputy Conway arrives on the scene, but just as the two officers engage Davis, he jumps back in his car and speeds away. Hildenstab's car is riddled with bullets and inoperable, so he jumps in Conway's car to continue the pursuit. Davis drives completely out of sight, but there's a backup plan in motion. Conway wants spikes to be set up down the road to deflate Davis's tires. By this point, the chase has almost reached the state line. Does Idaho have anyone in the area? Up ahead, an Idaho state policeman lays down the spikes with seconds to spare. They're coming! Watch out! 
Davis runs over the spikes. Air escapes rapidly from his tires, and he's slowing down. Come on, Marker 2. He's heading. But George Davis is not about to give up. Somehow, he maneuvers his disabled vehicle to face his pursuers. I heard our engine rev up, and I, I knew Deputy Conway decided I knew what he was going to do. He didn't announce it to me, but I could tell that he was going to ram him. Conway rams the Ford Taurus at close to 60 miles an hour. With the officers speeding toward him, Davis actually opens his door so he can get a clearer shot. But he misses. As the smoke clears, Deputy Conway's okay, but Hildenstab, whose seatbelt is broken, is thrown into the windshield. It had blinded me. When I tried to open my eyes, I had all kinds of glass shards and stuff in my eyes. Hildenstab's leg is broken, and he's writhing in pain on the ground. The Idaho policeman drags him behind Conway's car to take cover. Stay down now. Stay down. Right here. Right here. Stay down. Put your hands outside the door. Right now. Put that left hand outside the door. Amazingly, Davis's gun, which was thrown upwards from the impact of the collision, has landed back in his car. You could see later and looking at the videotapes that he was trying to retrieve the gun again. He hadn't given up the fight yet. But Davis has run out of luck. He has gunshot wounds and an injured back, and he's going nowhere. The Idaho policeman handcuffs Davis and pulls him out of the vehicle. Still conscious, Davis strikes up a conversation. I don't know. Was it fun to you? What a rush, huh? Okay, yeah. wish, we would have killed you. wish we would have killed you? Well. Hildenstab is still nursing his broken leg, but he says his pain is overtaken by the intense emotion of knowing he's helped capture George Davis. That was just so probably an exhilaration I'll never feel in my life again. You know, I was happy. I mean, it was just a great feeling. And it seemed like at the time one of the happiest moments in my life. I had uh, got this guy stopped and I survived it. As Davis's shooting spree comes to an end, one of his victims, Michael Carroll, is struggling to survive. My son, he had just turned five two days ago. Like he could not have a dad all of a sudden. Like that was um, a really powerful thing for me. To everyone's surprise, Carol pulls through, as do the five others who survived the shooting in Ennis. But there's a long road to recovery for Carol. Getting shot was easy. Like, the really hard part was recovery. Before the shooting, Carol weighs 165 pounds. After his recovery, he's down to 112, and his rage is overwhelming. The more I sat there and dwelt and hated him uh, even though he was in a small old jail cell and I was out in the open it was still giving him the power over me on the day the 46 year old Davis is sentenced to life in prison without parole Carol confronts him in the courtroom uh, made sure to tell him that um, if he had all thought like he had done anything to hurt the people in this town like it had the opposite effect it it was amazing how much it brought this town together and united people. The people of Ennis, Montana rally around Carol with boundless support, even offering him free medical care. Carol and his son are closer than ever, and they don't have to worry about George Davis. It would be uh, a much different feeling knowing that he was out and uh, not caught. So uh, I'm very thankful for that. I mean, the jobs that a cop has to do every day, it's amazing. I have a lot of respect for what they do. Okay, 